Okay, so here we are today to discuss about MRCOG part two. Uh, I'm sure you all must be aware of the exam curriculum, how it goes and things like that. So we are just trying to cover the new recent guideline and talk how to read the guidelines and talk and how to make your own notes and uh, how to approach the talk reading basically, because sometimes the students don't get uh, the enough uh, idea about what to read, what to leave. This is also very important because practically you cannot read everything and remember everything. So this is the purpose of this webinar. Most of you must be knowing me. I'm Dr. Shweta, MDMRCOG. I'm now presently working in BART NHS uh, Trust in London in UK. So I did my MRCOG in 2019 and uh, definitely it was a beautiful journey. I cleared all my parts in first attempt. Uh, I was lucky enough and I was hardworking enough. Maybe I will say that I got enough support from my family and definitely the luck play a role. So sometimes it's not your time. So even if it is your first attempt or a repeat attempt, don't get disheartened because we are not students anymore. We are professionals. We have to handle many things, our family, our work, as well as the exam. I would like to congratulate our all successful students, Dr. Shilpa, Dr. Bina, Dr. Akriti, Dr. Farheen, Dr. Sri Lakshmi, Dr. Revti, Dr. Akriti, Dr. Mariam, Dr. Rupa, Dr. Shobna. Few of them cleared it in first attempt. Few of them was depressed and disheartened with repeated uh, unsuccess. And then they have the courage to do it again and they succeed with flying color. So as I told you, this exam is like that. You don't have to get disheartened if you couldn't succeed in first attempt. Just get up and try again with right guidance, with different strategy, and you will succeed. What is our agenda today? To introduce a new course for July 2023 exam. How you can start preparing, how to make notes, how to approach the talks, how to solve the SVAMQs what material to follow, how to set the right timeline, and how to succeed. So if you see the calendar, it's the exam in January, 17 January, and in July, it is 5 July. So if we take it from now, we have more than six months, which is more than enough for us to prepare in an organized way and pass the exam. Believe me, taking it too long also, you lose motivation. So you have to set your goals, you have to set your timelines, and then you have to start preparing by daily effort. Daily, you have to you have to spare a little bit of your time daily. Then only it can happen. So uh, if you leave it, no, I'm not prepared for this timeline, then I will go next exam. It, you will keep postponing and you will keep losing the zeal because when you are starting, you are fresh, your enthusiasm is more. And the more prolonged anything is, your enthusiasm keep losing. So prepare well, set your timelines and start preparing and give your exam on that timeline until unless some untoward event happened and you cannot give the exam. My uh, suggestion would be that fix your goal and approach towards your goal in a right way. So for the July exam, the course will be starting in January. This is a course which gives you a free crash course because definitely the crash revision at the end uh, matters the most when you start so early and it's the right time to start don't think that six months or seven months is not enough it's enough if you start in an organized manner within three months you can finish your reading uh, if you have already given the exam definitely you can finish in three months your revision and then you keep revising till the exam comes so the crash course really make a difference because you get the tips of emq solving how to approach the questions and how to go about the recalls. So this is a course feature. It includes all the specific points. If you, uh, when we do the recall session, actually, I realize that I don't have to open anything anywhere. Whatever we have covered in the sessions, everything is covered from the recall. So if you do an organized way of study, if you already remember all the important points of GTG and talk, then it's not difficult. Only thing is you should know what is important to read and what is important to leave in talks because practically you cannot read all the talk and remember all the talk. So that's the main thing. GTG all, GTG all nice, important nice is important. So definitely that you have to be thorough with. But in talk, you need a smart study and we cover more than approximately 125 talks in the 
discussion. So that really helps you to give an extra edge. So you can start with us, achieve with us, and become part of our family, AMMR Surgery family, which is like an extended family to me. I always think my students are not my students, but like my friends, my uh, sisters, my family, and I really uh, keep motivating them every day so that they can achieve their goal. Because as we are doing everything, it's difficult to uh, keep motivated ourselves on our own. So some of you might be giving January exam for January. There is EMQ recall course where there is free talk question banks because most of us lack in talks. Most of us ignore the talks. So this question bank really help. EMQ tips really help because it gives you a clarity of what to choose in which question, which scenario. And recall give you an insight of the important topic to revise in the last month. So in the last month, you can also revise everything. So recall question are not to fix the answer of recalls only but to revise that particular topic again in this last one month. So that definitely increase your chance of success. If you find some of the module difficult, you can uh, opt for any module if you find it is very difficult because every question matter in exam. If you if you make wrong one or two question, you will lose the exam by one, two, three marks, which is very uh, painful. So uh, if you feel any of your module is weak and you need help with that, you can go for this module plan. There are mock plans. If you want to question, you want to do only question practice. Now you are done with your reading. You are thorough with your reading. You can test yourself by the mocks. And definitely the final mocks give you the exam fear will go away and you will be able to uh, come out of the exam fear. And you can make your strategy in your real exam in a better way. So whenever you're reading you have to read everything all together and make your notes of all together in one place so that before exam you can review it in two three pages that is what you have to look for while you are making the notes for talk study as i told you you have to smart you do a smart study leave few topics leave read some topics so that you have to be careful about what to leave what to read so you definitely need a right guidance there is a free Telegram group if you have any doubt anytime you can put there. I keep telling you all please please participate if you want to get guidance, please participate put questions. Some of you I think some of uh, one of you has written today that where is the recall group? See you don't have to look for groups what you have to practice on your own. If you want to practice in the group you can practice post the question in the group. The students will participate. It's like a group study. You have to help each other. You cannot do it alone because you need help because you have many other things to do. So you have to keep motivating each other. So the free group is the purpose is that that you post questions and people will help you with that. You have a healthy discussion so it will retain in your mind. So always it's welcome to post any question any doubt in the group and get the right guidance. Clear concept, precise notes is must before exam, otherwise it becomes difficult. So don't go unprepared in exam just for a trial because this exam, try your knowledge in depth and it's difficult to pass with superficial knowledge. So don't think that uh, let me try this time and then I will see, don't do that. You have to work hard. You have to be 100% sure that you're prepared before you are giving the exam. And if you think you are not, take help from the mentors, take help from your friends, from the study group, whatever, but don't go half-heartedly to the exam. So for July, it is the right time to start because we are well ahead in time. We can revise as many times as we want. So right time to start. First, you will be not ready. Then you will gradually become potential ready after your readings and question solving. And then finally, before exam, you will be fully, fully ready and confident. So let's start the intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. This is the latest guideline of 2022 June. Why this guideline is important? Because earlier it was old guideline where there was different concepts. So whenever there is an old, the guideline become old, like 10, 12 year old, then definitely a new guideline come because of according to new research or new development. So this guideline is very, very important for July exam. And definitely you will get question from this guideline in July. Because whenever the new guideline come, the new questions come, right? Because uh, the topic is same, but the new questions will arise. So uh, definitely you will get question from this in July attempt and might be in January attempt, which might be a like 
because the guidelines start developing from long time before it came in june that doesn't mean that the work has started long back so from january itself you will see in different places different article like that and the finally the guideline come so there there is chance that few question might come in january but in july surely the questions will be there from this guideline so let's go through this and this will give you an idea about how to approach the guidelines because now the guideline format has changed earlier it was uh, in a different format bold line and then uh, the details now it has become boxes and they give you in boxes the details so uh, the format has they have changed the format a little bit of the guidelines so first of all you should see the key recommendation what they have written so if you see intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy what is it or we know it as obstetric cholestasis of pregnancy so this is a cholestasis means the bile acid it is related to the bile acid retention in the body when that happened what happens because of the bile acid there is itching in the skin so when you go through this guideline you will realize that there are question from an old talk of 2013 of itching in the skin problems skin problems in the pregnancy so simultaneously you have to read that talk also of 2013 because you want to match the information so obstetric cholestasis or intrahepatic cholestasis is a one part of itching the other is purpuric eruption of the pregnancy atopic eruptions of the pregnancy uh, and uh, there is herpes gestationalis so these are the four main dd of itching in pregnancy and these are always exam question of itching in pregnancy or skin problems in the pregnancy so this guideline definitely important but at the same time the tog also simultaneously you have to read to uh, make the dd of what you are dealing with because they will not always give you intrahepatic cholestasis if a skin problem new guideline has come then all the skin problem you should revise so that that tog is also very important for you to revise so revise that with this so this is how somebody should guide you that what guideline what tog are available what i should read with what Uh, to getting the tog in one place so that all helps if somebody guide you in a right direction that really helps so what is icp it is itching in the skin of normal appearance very important every word and line of guideline is important even in between the line line you have to read so normal appearance means there shouldn't be any rash rash in pregnancy is different rash could be because of many thing because of viral infection because of many other things but in obstetric cholestasis or intrahepatic cholestasis there should be no rash skin of normal appearance and there should be itching so do you think that if she itch if a woman itch there will be nothing in the skin there will definitely be a scratch mark right so with itching there will be scratch mark but there will be no rash rash is different and scratch mark is different so a skin of normal appearance but because of itching there could be scratch mark in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy and there should be raised bile acid which is very very important raised bile acid 19 or more so this has changed now so whatever change from the old guideline become more important to ask in the questions so you have to remember it is now 19 or more total bile acid of 19 or more so if they give you 18 that is not by uh, uh, bile acid retention that is not cholestasis of pregnancy so this has changed now the criteria and as i told you it's always itching of normal appearance skin but still there will be scratch mark now what other things have changed is additional lab test are routinely not recommended earlier what it was said in the guideline that you have to rule out other things because obstetric cholestasis is a diagnosis of exclusion but now they have told that additional tests are not needed until and unless you see any atypical symptom any comorbidities like diabetes hypertension hepatic problems early onset because usually it start in third trimester but it doesn't mean that it can never start in first and second trimester but good thing about rcog is it always give you a common pictures to help you in making the diagnosis so it start in third trimester means usually in exam they will give you a women with 30 weeks 32 weeks with itching that means they are taking you towards obstetric cholestasis because the topic eruptions will be coming in first and second trimester so they always give you the commonest presentation so intrahepatic cholestasis come in third trimester most commonly so if it is early onset you have you should rule out other problems so you will be doing the additional lab and imaging so additional lab and imaging is not recommended routinely is what you have to understand then you have to do an additional postnatal investigation because 
ultimately it's a pregnancy related thing so it should disappear postnatal four weeks so earlier there were confusion 10 weeks four weeks six weeks whatever so now they have made it very clear that you have to repeat it at four weeks so this has changed you will discuss with the women the care for now they have graded it as mild moderate severe earlier it was not there in the guidelines so mild moderate severe the category they have given accordingly the delivery time is different so the weeks of pregnancy is different when you are going to plan the delivery so definitely you are going to get the question in exam about they will give you a case of either mild moderate severe and they will ask you when you are going to plan a delivery for her because this is a clear cut question and this is a new thing so they want you to uh, know that the recent thing are you updated with the recent guidelines so definitely it's an important question for you in exam uh, so care of the women you have to discuss if there is uh, there is any atypical presentation if it's very early as we are thinking about hepatic problem you have to discuss with hepatologist and then as i told you postnatal at least four weeks after birth you have to test the results uh, of bile acid to see that it has resolved that means it was obstetric cholestasis so this is a grading of mild, moderate, and severe. 19 to 39 is mild, 40 to 99 is. In guideline, be very clear. 99 is moderate and 100 is severe. So always remember this. They never confuse you more than equal to where they give the equal is very important. So whenever you are reading, like in miscarriage guideline, more than equal to 7 mm, more than equal to 25 mm. So always equal sign is where you should remember because they sometimes play with you by giving you if they give you 100 here you will put put it in severe so it, it is 99 here it is not 100 so be careful about reading every small finer detail you should keep in mind so 19 to 39 less than 19 is normal so 19 to 39 is mild where you will deliver by 40 weeks 40 to 99 you will deliver by 38 to 39 weeks and 100 and more which is severe where the, they say that only in this category there is a risk of stillbirth and you will deliver them at 35 to 36 weeks because you don't have any monitoring bile acid basically is toxic and it can go to the heart and it can cause toxicity and suddenly the baby die so even if the ctg is normal you don't know that next minute what is going to happen so you cannot monitor the baby that's the problem that's why you have to make a guideline that when is the safest period for her to deliver. So they, they, they say that the risk of stillbirth is only for 100 or more. So keep that in mind, that risk of stillbirth is only for 100 or more, and you will deliver at 35 to 36 weeks. There is no treatment to improve the outcome. So as there is no treatment, you can only give her symptomatic treatment by giving her uh, antihistaminic for itching, for lotion for itching. But they say that there is no treatment which will change the bile acid concentration. There is no treatment which will improve the pregnancy outcome. That's why you are making it safe delivery. So you are trying to deliver early. Now they have changed that routinely you are not going to offer them arsodeoxycholic acid. Why routinely? Because Earlier it was like you can give them arsodeoxycholic acid. Now they say that no benefit of it, only 5% get benefited by this. So no need of routinely giving everybody and it is not going to change the itching. It is not going to change the bile acid concentration. So if needed, only you will give. So it should be less than 5% because it doesn't help much. So the only treatment available with you is lotion either or antihistaminic just for symptomatic relief. And the ultimate outcome you cannot change. That's why carefully you're trying to deliver them early. So what they say that 0.7% of the pregnancy ICP is a, if you see the prevalence, it's 0.7%, but in Indian Asian, Pakistani Asian region, it is 1.2 to 1.5%. So here in Bards, which area I am, we are dealing with more of Indo-Asian and Pakistani Asian origin women. So we see a quite a lot of obstetric cholesterol in our setup. So you should remember in mind in the question, if they give you Indian Asian or Pakistani Asian origin, the incidence, if they ask you, you will choose 1.2 to 1.5, not 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is generalized for everyone, multi-ethnic multi population. But in particular nationality, it is more, which makes it almost double, 1.2 to 1.5%, right? So it's a multifactorial condition because you don't know the cause sometimes. And most of the time they say that, you just have to monitor the bile acid and accordingly you proceed. 
Pruritus in the absence of primary skin condition. We already discussed that. It is most common in third trimester. We discussed that, but can be earlier in pregnancy. Bile acid concentration are not associated with the itching. This is important because we think that more bile acid, more itching. It is not like that. It is not associated with intensity. It depends upon the women body and individual characteristic. So now this is how they have graded it, mild, moderate, and severe. And what is gestational pruritus? Gestational pruritus is the one uh, the, uh, where there is perium like sparing the pure period of pregnancy. So itching with peak, bi peak bile acid less than 19 means it is not related to obstetric cholestasis. So that is gestational pruritus and then mild, moderate, severe according to the bile acid level. So when you have to do additional investigation means you have to look for hepatic causes for viral infection like hepatitis infection. You have to look for immuno immunological problems. When you will do that, you will do that if there is any atypical uncertain picture, markedly elevated transaminase means hepatitis. If hepatitis infection, it will be the transaminase will be more than 500,000 like that. But in uh, uh, obstetric cholestasis, you will usually see that it will be in range of 100, 200, 300 like that. So markedly elevated means you want to rule out hepatitis. So you will be doing CMV and hepatitis, hepatitis A, B, and C. Early onset means you want to rule out other things. Rapidly progressive means may bile acid, this obstetric cholesterol is not going to rapid, rapidly progress, but if there is any infection, it will rapidly progress. So that's important. Any feature of liver failure, evidence of acute infection, you have to rule out because there are many infections, viral infection, which will affect the liver and can lead to this picture of raised liver enzyme and things like that. So that is important. Liver failure usually will not happen in uh, obstetric cholestasis. So if there is evidence of liver failure, think about something else. So mainly you have to rule out other things when you are making a diagnosis of OC is what is important. If resolution does not occur after birth, after four weeks, it is important. That's why you are repeating it at four weeks to prove your diagnosis because there is nothing to prove your diagnosis. You are suspecting the diagnosis of obstetric cholestasis if the bile acid is raised, but how to confirm it if it resolves four weeks postnatal? So that's important. What are the risks associated? They will ask you what are the maternal. They will give you an SBA that what could happen to the mother, what could happen to the baby, and they will change one of the options. So maternal risk, the risk of preeclampsia is higher. They say gestational diabetes is higher. They say, so if you see the odds ratio, 3.7 and 2.4. So preeclampsia is maximum and then gestational diabetes is also higher with OC. In such situation, if you see 12.2 in place of 3.4, so approximately 3.7 times and 2.4 times, which is quite significant, isn't it? So keep it in mind that preeclampsia gestational diabetes risk will increase for an OC woman. Perinatal risk, you have to counsel always to her that stillbirth risk is more. We are always worried about stillbirth with obstetric cholestasis. Preterm will be more. Meconium stain amniotic fluid will be more. Neonatal care uh, requirement and ICU will be more. So they say that this is mainly for moderate and severe. So more than 40. Both of this more than equal to 40, right? For preterm, they say mild, moderate, severe, 16, 19, and 30. So they might ask you in the exam that, uh, what is the risk of preterm with they will give you a range of uh, bile acid so you should diagnose mild moderate or severe and then what is the risk of preterm so percentage they can ask you that what is the risk of stillbirth definitely they can ask you that so 0.29 percent then again the stillbirth rating uh, grading change with uh, the mild moderate severe if you see overall it is 0.29 with mild 0.13 with moderate 0.28 and with severe 3.44 very high isn't it that's why severe is where you deliver between 35 to 36 weeks. But if you see there is no IUGR, don't think that obstetric cholestasis women will have IUGR, so you will never order growth scan for them. And as such, there is no modality with which you can monitor them, which will, uh, which will be, you will be able to tell them you are safe or unsafe or whatsoever. So it's very, very important for you that these are the risks, but you cannot do anything about it. You can just monitor them. There's no modality which will help in changing the outcome. That's the problem. That's the problem with this disease. You cannot do anything. You can only monitor them. And that too, the monitoring is not uh, tell you anything about acute events. So this is very, very important for you to remember that stillbirth risk is very, very high with severe, which is 3.44% and which could be an SBA. What is the risk of stillbirth with severe? 
they will they will not tell you severe they will give you the range of bile acid make a scenario long scenario and they will ask you the stillbirth rate so remember it well stillbirth is always favorite topic of exam then what else has changed is how frequent repeat testing to be done so repeat earlier it was like weekly you have to do if it is not deranged and symptom persists you can do one weekly one to two weekly like that but now they have changed it completely now they have made it that you have to do the testing in the beginning so you will be doing liver function test and bile acid in the beginning and you will repeat it after one week and then you will see the trend and accordingly you will determine your frequency at individual basis so now they have not mentioned that after one week what you are going to do so if it is rising or it is raised then definitely you can monitor it weekly but they have not mentioned clearly now in guideline that how frequently you have to do but definitely you have to do two times one time when at presentation and one time after one week so this is very very important two times at least you have to do and then decide so in exam they might give you that you did the liver liver enzyme and bile acid it is raised so what you will do so you will repeat it after one week and then individualize the treatment so second bile acid measurement one week later is fixed you are going to do that for everybody so keep that in mind now they say that when it comes near the dangerous time like as a, anyone when cross 37 weeks you can deliver them but for mild our criteria is we want to deliver from 40 weeks so how you are going to monitor them for them you can do weekly testing from 38 weeks the same way for moderate you want to deliver at 38 weeks you so you can do weekly testing from 35 weeks so how they will make a question they will make a long scenario they will give you the bile acid level of this and then they will ask you how you are going to monitor this women so you will choose weekly testing from 38 weeks for moderate you will choose weekly testing from 35 weeks so this can definitely be a management question of sba for icp so this kind of question they make where there is numbers where there is uh, protocols included rules included that kind of questions are made in exam now in treatment as i told you no treatment only emollient the lo local application and antihistamine are the two things they recommend and do not routinely offer oxycholic acid is what they say vitamin k always our confusion shall we give vitamin k or not so you will give vitamin k only if there is steatorrhea means fat in the stool or abnormal pt so you will not give it to all you will give it only if there is a steatorrhea or there is abnormal prothrombin type so this is very very important for you to remember that now the treatment is only two thing only symptomatic treatment nothing else labor management in labor management will there be any difference so you have to understand that they say that continuous electronic fetal monitoring only for severe cholestasis no need in mild and moderate the problem is the guideline is written it's a guideline so many information is there that sometimes you miss the small small information which might be asked in the exam so when you read you should be able to understand which point i should grab and which point i should leave so when they have written that for mild or moderate there is not enough consensus to do uh, uh, continuous monitoring for mild definitely no for mild it will be just like a normal labor that's why you are starting the indu induction also from 40 weeks so mild is almost like a low risk for moderate their evidence is not enough to do continuous monitoring so for severe only they have written that you have to do continuous monitoring so keep that in mind in question they will give you a severe cholestasis scenario and then you will choose the continuous monitoring not for all so it's very important for you to discriminate mild moderate severe their management their diagnosis their monitoring in a different way induction of labor you can always do there is never ever straight away cesarean section so always you can induce her standard analgesia and anesthesia you can do there is no change there is no risk of increased pph earlier in previous guideline it has been given that pph increases but here they have given that there is no evidence of increased pph so keep that in mind whatever changes from the previous guideline it's very very important that you keep that in mind then comes the postpartum contraception in contraception earlier they told that ocs you shouldn't give but now they say that you can give ocs but if with ocs if you give oral contraceptive pills and she develop the itching and obstetric cholestasis feature then you will not give it so you can give though you will prefer only progesterone and non hormonal but you can give ocs also if she doesn't develop cholestasis with ocs but you have to make her aware that there is a risk of developing 
this with the oral contraceptive pills. So preferred is this, but even you can give OCs to her. It's a great too. Uh, you can see too. Repeat testing you will do after four weeks, which is very, very important to confirm the diagnosis of that your diagnosis was correct if it resolves. And then it will help you in planning her next pregnancy. You can make her aware, make her educated that in next pregnancy, you will do the baseline LFT and bile acid at booking. Now, this information is also very important. They will give you a scenario and obstetric cholestasis delivered, resolved at four weeks. Now, what next? So in next pregnancy, you are going to do baseline LFT and bile acid at booking. And why you want to do that? Because you want to see that it has resolved. There is no residual thing. You don't know if she's already having a liver problem. So always make sure that at booking, you recheck her that now it is normal. So because there is a chance of recurrence, isn't it? There is a chance of recurrence. So how to know that it is a new development or a residual effect? So for that, you should do at booking baseline LFT and bile acid. So if you see the guideline is more than 25 pages and we finished it just in 10 slides. How we finish that? Because we only grab the important information which can be asked in the question. So this is how you have to read the guideline. Yes, you read the guideline fully. You read it one time, you will not be able to understand what is important, what not. You read it two times, you'll be able to understand. You read it three times and then you are ready to make your notes. Then just to make a one page note. Don't make notes of guideline after reading first time because if you do that, you will note down whole guideline, which doesn't make sense. Second time when you read, you already know the questions. So it's better understanding, better remembrance, but still don't make the notes. Third time when you read, then you make your notes. Notes are not to make it like copy, copying the guideline on the paper. Notes are to your final revision. So it should be very short. It should be only one page, which you have to see before going to exam. So it shouldn't be exhaustive. Otherwise, you cannot go through it. Then what is the point in writing when you cannot go through it? And piles and piles of paper, which you cannot go through before exam. No point. So the note should be only concise. For short guideline, one page is at max two pages if your writing is big and wide. So one or two pages for short guideline. For big guideline, like a VT guideline and a very big, big guideline, you might make it four pages. That's maximum. So the notes are not to write down the guideline. It is for your final revision, the numbers, the points, which you keep forgetting. You get my point because many of time I've seen the students they are telling me I'm making notes, but it has I'm writing at the end. I'm writing everything. So notes are not in the beginning after the third reading when you remembered all the thing and which you just want to have a glance before going to exam. So your guideline get revised in 10 minutes because now you remember everything, but you just want to revise the figures. You just want to revise the important rules of the guideline. So first reading is a complete no no for notes for some small guideline. If you understood well after two reading you can make but for big guideline after three reading only make the notes very very important. Anybody has any doubt about obstetric cholestasis before we go to the talk of recurrent pregnancy loss. Do you want to ask anything? Do you have any doubt how to make notes of GTG? Can I help you with anything with the GTG reading? You have any doubt in your mind? Did you get anything by this? Can I ask you a few questions? If you don't have any question, I have many. Can I ask you a few questions about this guideline now? Okay, so let me recap. Obstetric cholestasis, there will be no rash. It will be a normal skin with itching, raised bile acid, more than 19. It's graded in three category, mild, moderate, severe, which is more than 19. So 19 to 39, 40 to 99, and more than equal to 100. These are the three grading. The risk of stillbirth is only with this one, the severe one. The treatment is only topical application and antihistaminic. The risk for mother, preeclampsia, and diabetes, risk for baby, stillbirth, preterm, meconium stain, amniotic fluid, and increased risk of neonatal care. But there's no risk of IUGR. And you have to repeat the testing weekly near the time of delivery because the risk increase. And in labor management, only continuous fetal monitoring for severe one, 
and repeat testing after four weeks. Very, very important. In next pregnancy, you have to do the baseline testing at booking level, which is 10 weeks. So this is all. When you already know the basic, this is all. There is no increased risk of PPH, which is important because change in the new guideline. So I hope you get clarity. Now let's go to the top. Management of recurrent pregnancy loss. This is also a very old guideline of 2011. So I'm very happy that the new TOG has come and now the new guideline will also come. Maybe next year in the beginning or uh, in the middle, the new guideline will come, which they have mentioned already in the TOG and at the RCOG sites and things. So recurrent pregnancy loss is always a happening topic and in exam always you get question from this. So whenever you read a talk, topics, in the talk there will be some very advanced topics which are beyond your limits like infertility, new new things will come, laparoscopy, new new things will come, neurogynecology, new new things will come. But they are not going to ask you that in depth because that is super specialization. At MRCOG level, MRCOG part two is ST5 level where you are not doing super specialization, you should have the basic knowledge of ob -gyne. So they don't expect you to be thorough in laparoscopy, infertility, urogynecology, oncology, only basics, right? So you should select which talk you, you have to read and which talk you don't need to read. Because if you try to read every talk, you cannot recollect anything. So recurrent pregnancy loss is always important to us. So we will go through that. What are the key points they have mentioned in this? Recurrent pregnancy loss, if you see the guideline, uh, it says that it, uh, any pregnancy, any losses, three or more consecutive pregnancy before 24 weeks is recurrent pregnancy loss. And it affects one to 3% of all women trying to conceive. This is a traditional one, this is the old one. So now what is new? The new thing coming is, they are telling that the new guideline have come to 2017 ASHRAE report has come and they say that even two cons two losses you should take significant because here it is three or more. How much will be the psychological impact on a woman who is losing three or more baby consecutively that too? And you're doing nothing saying our guideline says that three or more we are going to evaluate. So you are still two so we are not going to do anything for you. It doesn't look good isn't it? It doesn't look fair for the women's psychological aspect. So definitely they have come up with a new thing saying that two, even two losses you should evaluate. So this is the new come up, which will be coming in the next guideline. That even two losses you should evaluate and not necessarily it should be consecutive. Why only consecutive should get the importance? Any losses for women is traumatic psychologically. And they say that 26% of the time only you find a cause and 74% you don't find anything. So, which is further more difficult to explain to the women that we have no answers to you in 74% of the time, isn't it? So, that's the problem of recurrent pregnancy loss. You don't get the answer at the end after doing so many things, so many investigation, 74% uh, of the time you will not get an answer. So, whatever, the li limitation you have to tell to the women. But this is what is now become traditional. This is our old guideline definition, which is going to change now. In recurrent pregnancy loss, what you are looking for is modifiable risk factor because if some genetic problem is there, you cannot change it. If genetic problem in the parent, you cannot change it. You can only counsel them that this is the reason. So modifiable risk factor is your main focus because you want to change that so that her outcome can become better in the next coming pregnancy. So you want to give a psychological support, which is very, very important because losing a baby, a miscarriage, um, abortion is not an easy thing. Losing a baby definitely have a psychological effect and impact on the women. And if it is repeated, then it is very much traumatizing for her. But the problem is we don't have enough evidence. We don't have enough good quality evidence. There is controversies about recommendation of investigation and management. So definitely they will give you a question from this talk in the exam, because now this is a new development from an old gu guideline. So this talk you have to go through. Always the topics are same important topics in exam. It never changes. Always ectopic pregnancy will be important. Recurrent pregnancy loss will be important. Nausea vomiting of pregnancy will be important in early pregnancy. It will never change. And it's a small module. So definitely anything new you should go through well. What they have mentioned is losing three biochemical pregnancies higher than losing three clinical pregnancies. 
So sometimes they might make an SBA saying that, what is the chance of losing further baby uh, if there is biochemical loss? Biochemical losses means you couldn't see the baby in scan, only the beta HCG came positive and she lost the baby, lost the pregnancy. So in biochemical pregnancy, it is 22% loss rate further, while in clinical pregnancy, it is 0.3%. So just keep it in mind that how much big difference it is. So when you read a talk, just try to focus on what they are telling to you very impactfully and what is just given as a study, as an information. So you will understand what to remember, what to leave. Because talk are vast, but it has to read like an article and take out the important points. So it should be hardly 10, 20 points, not more than that. So if you see now the definition is going to two losses compared to three losses and either consecutive or non-consecutive, it doesn't matter is what they're going towards because they're taking it more seriously. Etiology, if you see the etiology, can anybody tell me what is the most common cause of losses? What is the most common cause of pregnancy loss? Chromosomal effect, ma'am. Very good. So chromosomal effect, we all are aware, is the most common cause. The same goes with the recurrent pregnancy loss that chromosomal problem are the most common problem in pregnancy. So fetal, most common, in which aneuploidy is the most common cause. So most of the time in exam, they ask you, which is the most common cause of recurrent pregnancy loss? So you will choose aneuploidy or chromosomal problem. So is it in fetus or maternal? It is never maternal or paternal. It is always fetal aneuploidy. Fetal aneuploidy, what, why it happens? It happens because when the chromosome are when the fertilization happens, at that time, the chromosome didn't fall in place. If the mother ages more, the separation doesn't happen nicely. And then there will be trisomy, there will be triploidy like things. So that's why the age matters. As the age increase, the number of losses increase. Because at the time of fertilization, the chances of chromosomal mixing and bad outcome and aneuploidy, triploidy, trisomies increase with age. Because with age, the chromosomes are not fast enough, active enough to do a good job. So fetal aneuploidy is the most common cause, either for miscarriage, either for recurrent miscarriage. And then comes the maternal. So in maternal, what are the causes? Thrombophilia and uterine cavity abnormality. Either the mother blood is a problem, mother blood has carrying something, or the uterine cavity where the baby has to stay. These are the two areas which can go wrong. So in that, thrombophilia is our modifiable risk factor, which is the acquired thrombophilia. So what has changed now in this talk is the genetic thrombophilia, they say that no need of testing, no need of treating the genetic one. Because earlier in our guideline, it was like for genetic one, you have to give them heparin from second trimester. So that has changed now. No need of testing for genetics, only for acquired apply is enough. No need of chest testing for prothrombin gene and protein C, protein S, no need. No need of testing, no need of treating that is what they have come up with. And then the uterine cavity abnormality. In uterine cavity abnormality, either it will be septum, fibroid, submucosal fibroid, septum. Uh, sometimes it could be uh, uh, the cavity is not accepting the baby well, endometrial factors. Sometimes it will be male factor, even sperm. The, if the DNA fragmentation index of sperm is high, then there is a chance of miscarriage. So these are cavity abnormality, which is in the mother, which you might correct. Some you can correct, some you cannot correct. And then comes the unexplained, which is the maximum number. If you see the unexplained is 74% because by doing all the investigation, all the effort, you can diagnose only 26% of recurrent miscarriage reason. And 74% of the time you'll tell the women, tell the couple that we don't find a reason, I'm sorry. So it's very difficult, isn't it? But the good thing is with recurrent pregnancy loss, the next pregnancy outcome also is good. Most of the time with tender loving care, the outcome is also good. If the stress level of the couple you can keep down, the outcome is good. So that's a good thing. But definitely if something happened, you want to investigate. So you are focusing on this. This is most to explain, you cannot change it much, but this you can treat and change. So here we are going to focus in the treatment. 
So if you see the etiology, this is always exam question at what age, what is the risk of miscarriage? So please remember it well. And this is not something new information. This is always there in the old guidelines. So you can always get this question in the exam even in January. So remember it really, really well that how much is the risk of miscarriage with age? So if you see at the age increase, if you see from 30, it's approximately in the similar range, but from 35, it increased quite, quite significantly. From 35 to 39, it is one in four. So even, and now it's very common to become pregnant at 35, isn't it? Uh, 35 is the new 30 nowadays. So people are becoming pregnant after 35 and the risk of them losing the baby is one in four, which is quite, quite high, isn't it? If 40, it is one in two, which is further very high. Means a woman who is 40 year old, the chance of her losing her baby by miscarriage is one in two, 50%. Isn't it so significant? That's why they're asking you this. If more than equal to 45, which won't be a very common thing, but if that is there, it is almost, you know, 100%, 93. So it's quite high. So that's why they ask you that, are you understanding how age is affecting the miscarriage? That's why they always ask you 40. The risk is 51%. If they ask you 45, the risk is 93%. So please remember this chart really, really well. As I told you in talks, Remembering the charts is very, very important. Whenever you read a talk, your reading should be led through the charts and the flow charts and the boxes and the tables because that confines all the important information. So that will help you in remembering the things well. Now, most of the losses are because of aneuploidy, we all know. So mainly associated with chromosomal segregation error in oocyte. That's why with age it increases. If you see the, uh, the incidence of recurrent pregnancy loss occurring by chance, by chance means just no reason, by chance is only 0.13% for a young, young women, which increased to 13% for an old woman of 40 years. So from 20 to 40, it increased 100 fold by chance happening recurrent pregnancy loss. So we saw at 40, the miscarriage itself is so high. So keep this in mind. They might ask you that a woman who is 20 year or a woman who is 40 year, what is the difference of uh, the recurrent pregnancy loss risk? So it is 100 fold higher for a 40 year or old. So very, very important information. This is all to impact in your mind that how much it is important, how much age is important for miscarriages and recurrent losses. Now, if you see 26% of the patient only you get an explained cause. So remaining 74%, you don't get a cause. So you will say, sorry, we don't have an answer to you. So which is very disheartening, but we cannot do anything about it. The literature says that. So remember this, they might ask you that how many percentage of the women you find a cause. So these percentage are important. And these are not something you have to mug up, you know, uh, once you read, because you're seeing it in your daily practice so frequently, it's very easy to remember. It's like one in four, one in four, one in two, almost 93%, so almost reaching up to 100. It's easy to remember. If you apply it in your clinical practice, daily counseling to the women's in your clinic, you will never forget this. It's not something you have to sit and write and remember. Once you read, once you use it in your counseling, it will be very easy to remember in exam. Now, how you'll manage them because it is multifactorial. So lifestyle is what they have highlighted that lifestyle modification, psychological support, specific treatment of the cause is what you have to do. So what are the lifestyle factor? Exercise. So whatever they have written in this chart, how to read chart, leave the no evidence, no evidence things. What you have to remember is exercise, high intensity occupation, family history, maternal age, paternal age, if it is more than 40, previous losses, and BMI. So age BMI in the personal, age BMI exercise in the personal factor, and paternal age and family history and previous losses. So remember it like that, in a, like in story. So you will never forget that these are the reasons, lifestyle modification, which you can do for them. If you see with age, aneuploidy increase, but as the number of losses increase, the chance of euploidy loss also increase. This is a very important piece of information because they will ask you that uh, 
the women is losing uh, many pregnancies she has lost number of previous losses are more and what are the chances of her losing this pregnancy of having a neuploidy what is more likely a neuploidy or euploidy so if recurrent losses the chance of euploidy loss increase and this was written in the old guideline also but now they have made it in the table so highlighted it more so if you see the chromosomal abnormality of the fetus the commonest cause is chromosomal abnormality which is 70% in early pregnancy losses and 20% in the second trimester numerical abnormality most common in which trisomy is the most common so they may ask you which numerical abnormality so trisomy parental carriership means parental abnormality is very less which is 2 to 6% only so don't think that it's problem of the fetus parents is basically the problem of the fetus but in parents if you if you find if second or more losses in third loss if you check the genetics of the baby and you find a neuploidy the or any other problem chromosomal abnormality you check the parents sometimes what happen parents have a balanced translocation which while coming to the baby it become unbalanced so that's the reason but the problem is you don't of you cannot offer any treatment for that because they say that even if you do ivf and pgd the success rate is so less that naturally she conceiving a healthy baby is more compared to by ivf and pgd so they say that you shouldn't offer a treatment but at least you can explain them that this is the reason of your losses so that's why you are doing the parental genotyping you're not going to treat it but at least you can answer that this is the reason of your recurrent losses then the uterine anomalies congenital uter uterine anomaly if you see with a prevalence of 13.3% in those with history of miscarriage compared with 5.5 so approximately if you see two to three times high likely that these women have uterine cavity abnormality most of the time the outcome is normal even with bicornate uterus Uh, the outcome most of the time is normal except preterm birth sometime so not necessarily all anomaly you have to correct until unless you see and miscarriage with an anomaly no need of correcting it keep that in mind it's not like all bicornate uterus or all septa you have to correct if there is no problem clinically no need of correcting but if she come to you with recurrent miscarriage or miscarriage and then you find this then you can tell us that we can offer you treatment for this this might be a reason for your loss so in high risk population septa is common so septa you can treat for them there could be a quite problems in the uterus there could be congenital problem in the uterus so you have to explain them if it is congenital uterine anomaly that there is risk of cervical insufficiency so cervical insufficiency usually will lead to second trimester losses so if they give you a question of congenital uterine anomaly like she has bicornate uterus she has losses then most of the time it will be second trimester loss sometimes they say that there is endometrial factor which can lead to it which is cd1 t8 plus is what they have mentioned but still it is not uh, practical to test it or do anything about it it's just coming up so this chronic endometritis could be a contributing factor is what they are telling in thrombophilia i already told you hereditary thrombophilia these all you no know, need of testing no need of treating now only apply you have to test and if you see the apla prevalence in the guideline it was 15% now it has changed to 20% so 5 to 20% compared to 2% in the low risk and you can treat it so you should check for apla you should treat apla now no effect on recurrent pregnancy loss is also very important that where you are not going to treat anything if it is a overt hypothyroidism means she has hypothyroidism and symptom you are going to treat but subclinical no need because it's not related to recurrent pregnancy loss hypothyroid no need diabetes never lead to recurrent pregnancy loss prolactin disorder no pcod no ovarian reserve problem no lute insufficiency no male factor no so these are no no it is not affecting the recurrent pregnancy loss keep that in mind because in question they will give you this scenario and they will ask you is it related to recurrent pregnancy loss or they make make an sba saying which of the following is not associated with recurrent pregnancy loss or associated with recurrent pregnancy loss 
so keep this in mind only overt hypothyroidism is the one which can affect otherwise these are not going to lead to recurrent pregnancy loss so more than two third of those with recurrent pregnancy loss will have a live birth in subsequent pregnancy which is a good news more than two third means more than 66 percent will have a normal outcome in subsequent pregnancy which is a good thing because 74 percent of the time anyways you don't find a cause so at least the outcome is good so you have to just counsel them that don't worry more than two third of the time there is a chance that you will have a healthy baby next time so this will give solace to the women and that will help her in having a better outcome so if you see the investigation which has changed now so you should keep in mind what all tests to be done hereditary you are not going to test apply you are going to test earlier it was laaca now the new one is beta 2 glycoprotein which you are going to test for thyroid you can test tsh and hba1c for sugar if tsh and antibody is abnormal then you can do t4 for uterine anomaly earlier it was hcg hysteroscopy now they have come up with 3d ultrasound because they say this is a very good test for uterine anomaly so 3d ultrasound you can do for male factor they say the ashray say that sperm dfi can be considered so it's only considered so it shouldn't be your first choice if these are there you want to choose this as a test modality for recurrent pregnancy loss earlier it was that three or more losses you are going to test for genetics now with second pregnancy loss itself you are going to do the chromosomal analysis chromosomal analysis you will do if it is an euploidy then that is the reason so no further investigation but if it is euploidy loss then you want to do the recurrent miscarriage workup so you'll check for thyroid for sugars for ultrasound for uterus all these things you will do in chromosomal anomaly uh, this chromosomal analysis which testing you will use so you will use the array based comparative genomic hybridization this is the most recommended one to be done for the fetal retained product of conception chromosomal analysis so what will be the recommended investigation this is the recommended investigation chromosomal abnormality after two losses anatomical abnormality uh, in the uterus so 2d 3d scan accordingly first 2d always and then 3d if needed thrombophilia you want to do only for acquired apla endocrinological you will do tsh and hba1c rubella you always do for any infertile women or any early pregnancy women so this you will do so this is only your investigation panel now 2d 3d scan acquired thrombophilia and thyroid and hba1c this you are not going to do at all touch screen no nk cell no tpo antibody testosterone these are no and this individualize accordingly so remember this and remember this because individual assessment is something which is consultant call not your call so your job is to remember this what is recommended and what is not recommended am i making sense am i clear Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So this is the summary of, so we saw what all investigation we are going to do. These are the investigation we are going to do. Now, what all treatment we are going to do. So recommended is chromosomal analysis. If you do that abnormality is there, you can offer her IVF with PGD. So that is one thing you can recommend. But as I told you, the success rate is so less that natural conception will be the similar success rate for her so you will counsel her like that for anatomical abnormality you can do surgical treatment of fibroid surgical treatment of septum polyp addition you can consider individual assessment but surgical treatment of submucosal fibroid you are going to do thrombophilia you will give the unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin and low dose aspirin for apla which we all know for infection you can give antibiotic if there is infection otherwise no need empirically no need for endocrinological, you will treat diabetes, you will treat thyroid, you will treat hyperplectinemia. For male factor, only lifestyle modification is enough, but sometimes you can give antioxidants. If unexplained, now this is a new thing. If unexplained miscarriage, you can offer them progesterone. There was promised trial for progesterone, long time. 
uh, from the time I'm reading from 2017-18, it has telling that progesterone study is going on, 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 promise trial is going on. But now they have come up with a recommendation, but that unexplained recurrent miscarriage, you can give progesterone. This, this is a major change. And definitely they will ask you in exam that can you give progesterone or not? And what doses, when, how much, how long? So this is something really important to understand. In endocrinological, these three only you are going to treat. Only if overt hypothyroidism, only if diabetes is there, only if hypoprolactin is there. This we already give, so we are remembering already. Fibroid you are going to treat, so this is something they have told. For male, only lifestyle is enough, sometimes antioxidant, but the major change for us is progesterone. In general, you want to tell her to optimize her BMI, stop smoking, give them vitamin D. These are all important uh, things to optimize her health, to avoid the lifestyle things. You can consider limiting the coffee, caffeine to less than three cups a day if she has recurrent miscarriage. So this table is very, very important. There could be many questions from this table. As I told you, tables are always very important. So the new update about the progesterone, they say, new update you must have read in the nice early pregnancy guideline that any women with vaginal bleeding with one or more losses, now they recommend progesterone up till 16 weeks. So this is from NICE. This is already recommended there in the early pregnancy guideline of NICE, which is miscarriage and ectopic. So anyone with vaginal bleeding and one or more losses, you're going to give 400 milligram twice a day until 16 weeks. This is there in NICE, so this is not new. The new update is this one. For unexplained recurrent losses, you will give them progesterone 200 milligram twice daily. When they become pregnant or with vaginal bleeding and continue until 12 weeks. Right? If they have any bleeding, you can increase it even to 400 because for bleeding anyways, this rule applies. 400 twice daily up to 16 weeks. But for unexplained also, you can give them progesterone 200 PD up till 12 weeks. So this is something new has come. Am I making sense? About the uh, recommendation of change of progesterone with the, for unexplained, it's recommended to give progesterone. Am I making sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so just remember these facts because these are the one, the question, potential question from the top. They're not going to ask you everything. Whatever new, whatever change, they are going to ask that. Okay, so can I just, now we have gone through, some of you might have, might have read it already, some of you have just listened it now. So shall we recollect how much you got from the presentation? So can I ask you about the recurrent pregnancy loss? What are the changes you grab from it? Earlier it was three or more. Now what they are considering? Two. Two. Two or more, right? So now they are coming down to two losses. What has changed in thrombophilia? Hereditary thrombophilia, there is no need to do any investigations. Yes, so Only very important point. Hereditary, no need of testing only acquired. It acquired what has changed. <clears throat> Earlier you used to do ACLLA. Now what extra you have to do? Beta 2 glycoprotein. Very good. So beta 2 glycoprotein is the extra they added because that they, they say that it's uh, uh, from long time it is there, but now it has come in the guidelines that it uh, it can make the diagnosis more accurate of APLA. And uh, if APLA you don't treat, in guideline they have written that if APLA you don't treat, then only 10% success of pregnancy loss, 10% uh, success. But if you treat it with aspirin and heparin, it will be 60%, up to 60%. So it's quite a significant help with the heparin and aspirin. So you will give it. Now, in this talk, they have clearly mentioned that you will give it immediately when she become pregnant. 
means the pregnancy test is positive immediately you will start them on aspirin and heparin no need of waiting till the scan shows the heartbeat and things like that so immediately in a women who is apla positive you will give them aspirin heparin at the positive pregnancy test itself that's the change also okay what else we got uh, in the testing in endocrine what test you are going to do for a recurrent pregnancy loss women What are the endocrine tests you will do? ESH, ESH, and hemoglobin A1C. Yes. So these are the only two recommended tests. If there is no symptom, nothing. These two at least you will do because overt hypothyroidism can lead to recurrent losses, but not the subclinical. So subclinical you are not going to treat. And in the talk they have mentioned that if it is now the criteria they are changing to four. so more than 4 is overt is what they are telling so if it is less than 4 you are not going to do anything if more than 4 you are going to treat her i'm very sorry the temperature here is minus 5 it's very cold so my voice is not that clear <clears throat> okay what else has changed for unexplained recurrent losses earlier in guideline you will just off offer them tender loving care now what has changed Give progesterone. Progesterone. Two hundred milligram. Two hundred milligram. Very good. So two hundred BD, twelve weeks. What about the nice, nice early pregnancy guideline? What they say: the women with bleeding in pregnancy, when you can give them progesterone? A woman present to this could be your case even in part three, part three exam. Even there was this case that woman at ten weeks, suppose she came with bleeding. She has previous one loss. So, are you going to treat her or no? Yes, I'm going to treat. So, give her so progesterone. So, how you will treat progesterone? How long you will 400, give what dose? Four hundred mg BD up to sixteen weeks. Yes. So, this is the new recommendation from Nice Early Pregnancy that if she has one loss history. one or more previous losses with vaginal bleeding you are going to treat earlier it was not there so it's a recent change in 2021 because the progesterone promise trial has finished now so all these changes are coming so we are empirically giving in our clinical practice but now it has come in the guideline any women coming with bleeding with one loss you are going to treat them any women with three or more losses you will empirically treat them okay great so for the one who are preparing for july definitely the jan candidate i assume they are already prepared and they are revising well the key to success you all know is it cannot be without hard work but smart work is important dedication determination consistency every day effort focused approach take the breaks in between group study very important daily discussion very important right guidance very important right schedule revision and practice there are many other introductory session i have done where i have explained how to approach things in very much detail so i'm going short this time so these are the key to success but the most important one is each day little effort this is what i always tell to my student every day you have to do something that's the most important thing that's the right motivation And yeah, definitely, you have to read and solve the question. Pardon? I have a question about the progesterone. Shall we confirm that if it's a heart is positive before you use the progesterone? Did they mention in the guideline like this? Because they didn't. I mean, it's no, not. No, you. You will not give the progesterone without confirming the pregnancy. You have to have a live baby to give the progesterone. Okay, so positive fetal heart. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Always yeah. with positive fetal heart. Yes. Yeah. Because otherwise, problem. Yeah. Otherwise, you are supporting a miscarriage, maybe missed miscarriage, an embryonic pregnancy like that. Okay. So, how a course can help you? You all know that you get a daily schedule, monthly schedule, so it motivates you. Notes, materials in one place, group study, revision, and as many time you can revise. Balance of question reading, as well as question solving. 
Q and A sessions are there, EMQ sessions are there, mock exams are there. So all in all, you get everything in one place. So you don't have to collect on your own. So you have everything in one place. You have right guidance, daily motivation to do your work on daily basis. These are our EMQ sessions feedback. I already showed earlier also. These are our talk sessions feedback. So we have exclusive talk session where we cover all the talks of that module. That helps. This is our website where you get the free recordings as well as the students' feedback, testimonials, how they got benefited with MMRCOG. So anybody, thank you so much, Anam. Anybody who wants to, uh, you know, offer the course, they can avail special offer for all student and part one scorers. It's very important that you get personalized care. It's very important that you get constant motivation because this exam is a difficult one. So this is our course coming up for July, which is 350 pound with free crash course with early bird. But the students who are attending today or going through this recording later in YouTube for this one week till Christmas, you can avail it in 300 pounds. So if anybody is interested, can just message on this number if they want to enroll for the course. Starting in from the beginning in organized way is better. I always feel rather than going for at the end moment, I'm looking for crash course or I'm looking for question solving. Then my in-depth study is not there. In-depth knowledge is not there. So if you have more time in an organized way, definitely the success is sure and you can achieve it. These are the features of the course. These are our Facebook group, YouTube and Telegram free link where you can get the free material to access. Any query you can message me. Definitely you need support. Don't try to do it alone. Do it your friend, do it with the group, do it with the mentors, participate in the free group, anything is fine, but do something. Don't only think I become to, I want to become a MRCG, I want to pass exam and don't put an effort on it, then it's not possible. So if you are a very busy practitioner, you feel that you need help, uh, constant motivation, please participate, please come up and talk, talk to us. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for attending. Anybody has any questions are most welcome. Keep keep going through the YouTube recording. It keep motivating you about how to go through difficult topics. All the important topics like urodynamics, endometrial hyperplasia, many important topics from exam point of view, sexual assault, SGA recordings are there, uh, EOGBS, uh, to name a few. So I always try to put the recordings which are very, very important from exam point of view, SSI, sec, uh, UKMEC, uh, cervical screening, all these are there in YouTube. So if you want to go through there, you can go through there, help. It will help in your exam for sure. So thank you so much for attending today and I'm very happy to see so many people today, Noreen, Priya, Rehana, Manikam, Anam, Reema, Sugra. Thank you so much. Thank you, so ma'am. Bye-bye. Have a good bye, Sunday. Bye, ma'am. Bye.